The FCC still isn't so keen on internet freedom. A new car could cost as little as $22, and it's possible to fish people using Unicode. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire for April 25th, 2017, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you haven't checked out our Patreon yet, please do so. We have lots that we want to do for this show, but we can't do it without your support. My next goal is to add a monthly Q&A exclusively just for our patrons, and we are going to upgrade our ThreatWire set. Super excited about that. Patreon.com slash ThreatWire is the place to support the show, and the link is in the show notes. Now, first First off, internet freedom. We got some news from the freedom part of our threat wire spectrum to discuss today. First up comes from Canada. It's the Canadian Radio, Television and Communications Commission, the CRTC for short. They ruled in favor of net neutrality, stating that, quote, internet service providers should treat data traffic equally to foster consumer choice, innovation, and the free exchange of ideas. That means no preferential treatment of the big data companies that can pay the big dollars compared to the little guys who cannot necessarily afford it, but they have excellent content, like podcasters, for example. Of Canada's telecom providers, TELUS and Bell were all for preferential treatment while Rogers was not. As consumers, you will receive the same speeds on all sites that you visit it, give or take for server issues and location, obviously, as ISPs will not be able to serve up sites at different speeds depending on how much they have pocketed from said sites. Now down here in the States, we have a little bit of alternative news. We are seeing the FCC get closer and closer to abolishing net neutrality. On April 20th, the FCC approved a ruling deregulating business data services, or BDS for short, which allows for affordable access to the internet from schools, small businesses, libraries, community program businesses, small gas stations, etc., etc. By deregulating BDS, price caps on ISP service is being removed to allow for AT&T and Verizon to charge more for these small businesses. Yay, they can charge whatever they want. Public interest groups such as the Consumer Federation of America say that this will drive up costs for consumers. ISP price hike equals more overhead for a small business, which equals higher consumer end costs for the customer. Anything from a library card fee to a credit card transaction fee could see an increase with an average increase of $300 out of consumer pockets per year, according to the Consumer Federation of America. Now you may think, that's a small bit, why worry? although I think $300 is quite a bit of money. When FCC Chairman Pai, who used to be a Verizon lawyer, by the way, argues that price caps aren't necessarily for markets who have sufficient competition, in which he includes markets where only one ISP is at play. I don't know how that is sufficient competition, but he thinks it is. A 2016 FCC research study showed that 73% of BDS markets are single broadband providers served, a monopoly, so to speak. And due to these monopolies, small businesses pay over charges of 20 billion annually altogether due to no competition. The new elimination of price caps could increase that by up to 20 billion as well. Yikes. So unless ISPs choose to use all that new money to increase their speeds, build better infrastructure, and offer better customer service, I really don't see how this is helping consumers at all. Researchers at Chinese firm Kihu 360 in Beijing created two gadgets that cost $22 total and make the ability to unlock cars, open their doors, and sometimes even drive away that much easier. The new gadgets, dubbed HackKey, also work from much farther away with the researchers who call themselves Team Unicorn. I love your name, by the way, claiming to be able to steal a car from over a thousand feet away. The radio signal gadgets work as a pair, with one researcher holding one next to a key fob, and then the other one hiding the second one next to the car. The researchers next to the car spoofs a key signal, the car relays a reply handshake to that radio, the radio then copies it and sends it to the researcher holding the key fob, and the second researcher relays that handshake to the actual key fob. Now the key fob replies with the correct string of digits and then they bounce that back to the car and then boom the car unlocks. 
Yeah, it sounds simple. It looks pretty hard. Caveat, an attacker would need to know which car you are using and where you are going. They would need to be in near proximity to your key fob, so they would have to follow you to relay the code to their friend sitting next to your car. The code is demodulated by the two different devices, and it allows for a long transmission over a much farther distance. The devices work against NXP key fob chips, and the manufacturers could require a much tighter call and response between the key fob and the car to offset the problem. And this actually affects quite a few different cars. Alternatively, consumers can keep key fobs in a Faraday bag, kind of like I keep my phone in a bag, in a Faraday bag during DEF CON. Yeah, that's the thing. So they could block any kind of transmissions going out of the key fob. Also, don't steal cars. That's really bad karma. I don't suggest it. And in case you are wondering, no, I have never stolen a car. Our next story is about Punicode. Hopefully I'm saying that correct. It is used to represent Unicode as ASCII characters in host names. Whenever you're registering for a domain name for a new website, Punicode also allows you to register with foreign characters, such as kanji, for example, or basically anything that is not Latin. Since the world is very diverse and there are foreign characters all over the place, foreign characters do exist commonly in web domains. So popular browsers leave this as a default. Homograph attacks can happen whenever ASCII and Unicode characters are used together in a domain. So for example, if somebody used a Unicode Cyrillic A instead of an ASCII A, one domain would be the original ASCII, all ASCII, apple.com, which another would be xn-ppple-43d.com, which a browser will then translate so that it looks like apple.com, but the A is in Cyrillic, which is an alphabet used by Slavic folks, which originated from Greek letters. Luckily, browsers don't usually fall for these kind of attacks, but if all of the characters are registered using one language's non-Latin Unicode, then the browser can get tricked. This flaw was found by researcher Zudong Zhang, apologies for my translation there, and was explained in a detailed blog with a browser example for Apple. In it, xn-80ak6aa92e.com gets translated to, say, apple.com to our human eyeballs in a different font set by the browser and it opens up the site. Obviously, it's not the real apple.com, which means an attacker could totally fake out even the most paranoid of users. The only way that I could personally tell a difference between them two was because of the L's. The L's are different. In Cyrillic, it's a very simple line, while in ASCII, the L has a little tail at the end of it. Zhang reported that this bug was reported to Chrome back in January, and it has been fixed in Chrome 58 on March 24th. In Firefox, you can can enable Punicode translations by going to about colon config, search for Punicode, and then change network.idn show Punicode from false to true. So any domains will show up with the garbled ASCII character translation instead of the originating pretty Unicode. Others like Safari and Edge don't even support Cyrillic language fonts, so apparently these are not affected. This could be used as a phishing attack to hide an actual websites.com domain name, so if you are opening a link from your email, which of course I do not recommend at all. Make sure you are checking that it's ASCII, not something else. Thanks again for all the fine people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. Of course, if you can spare a bit of change, any bit helps us keep the show going completely independent and totally ad-free. We now have an audio-only RSS feed, we have extra content, and we have early access for our patrons. We might even feature your adorable adorbs fur babies in an upcoming episode because they are so cute. I love checking them out every single time you guys send in pictures. And of course, if you cannot donate, you can always hit the subscribe button to share this episode on your favorite social media page and use the hashtag ThreatWire so that we might see it and we might even retweet you. With that, I am Shannon Morris and I will see you on the internet. Sailor Moon.